Welcome. Thank you all so, so much for coming today. Can you um, that mic? <clears throat> it is uh, it's actually an honor and great pleasure to be doing this with you people today. Um, one of uh, FAMH's charitable activities is providing uh, free education to, to, to people, professionals, and the public. Uh, and we, you know, we're very thankful for the opportunity to provide you guys today with some of the leading edge uh, research and understanding around addiction and, and other related mental health conditions. My name's Corey Hetherington, and I am a co-founder and chairperson of the Foundation for Addiction and Mental Health. I am also a person in long-term recovery, which means I haven't had to have a drink or a drug since April 27, 2009. So I, I get the opportunity to give you a little bit of background around FAMH. Um, you know, our priorities, a little bit of how we like to share the understanding of addiction, um, why we think it is the number one mental health condition out there, our prevention slash wellness model, the importance of comprehensive assessments, and a treatment and recovery type framework uh, that we've developed to hopefully implement within you know, our healthcare system. So in short, we really just wanna change the way people think about addiction. Uh, we don't think that it's well understood, and not being well understood, it's hard to be effective in how we deal with it. So we want to promote the highest quality services in prevention, early assessment, and treatment of addiction. I want to touch on a term prevention, uh, mostly because I didn't understand what prevention means, and we'll, we'll see later on that uh, the definition of addiction uses the word primary chronic disease, and so if it's primary, it means, like, like how do you prevent something that's primary? If I'm born with it, how, how do I deal with that? So prevention, as I understand it now, from the people, <laughs> the medical advisors we have, uh, there's a primary, secondary, and tertiary aspect to it. And basically, we're trying to arrest the progression of the disease or minimize the symptoms or consequences associated with it. So if we can get you know, at addiction sooner, um, maybe we can even prevent substance use or substance abuse. So the three primary activities for us are education, building capacity, and subsidizing programs. The education of the public and actually training of professionals. Uh, I've understood that the training that doctors get in medical school is anywhere from four to eight hours. I, I don't know, after seven years of post-secondary education, I call it, I'm surprised that it's only 48 hours. So, um, you know, we want to help them out. We want to help them do better in their jobs. Um, we need to build capacity in the current system. So we want to have more what we call healthcare specialists, people that are highly trained um, and fairly sophisticated in the way they deal with people like me who have a severe case of addiction. We also want to create a new class of worker called the mental health care worker. Uh, and then we want to help implementate this program within existing clinics within, within the province and the city. So we want to subsidize comprehensive assessments and a lot of other activities uh, that we need for treatment. So most of us have company benefits, Alberta Health Care covers some things, but about 80% of what we need to deal with addiction has to come out of our own pockets today. So a quick slide for the state-of-the-art definition of addiction. It was adopted by ASAM, the American Society of Addiction Medicine, in April 2011, and adopted by the Canadian Centre for Substance Abuse in 2015. So in my mind, this is pretty leading edge. It's, it's new. Um, but addiction is a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. Dysfunction in these circuits leads to characteristic biological, psychological, social, and spiritual manifestations. This is reflected in an individual pathologically pursuing reward and or relief by substance use and other behaviors. Um, I think that's one of the most important pieces as also talking about the brain reward circuitry. 
A lot of people think that drug use and dr or substance use, substance dependency is addiction. It's not. It's a symptom of addiction. It's one of the most harmful and most alarming symptoms, but it is not addiction itself. So we, we try to figure out how to change the way people think about addiction. And for me, I, I like this analogy, I like this metaphor of the solar system and what we used to think as, as a society, as a group of people. We saw some things in the sky moving around, the stars basically. We figured out one day that some are planets, some are stars, some are different things. But basically they all moved around the earth in this common direction. And so we said, hey, the earth must be the center of the solar system. But there was this little nuisance type thing and it was called Mercury. And every now and then, Mercury would go backwards. So everything else goes forwards, but Mercury from time to time goes backwards. And everybody says, oh, okay, well, that's not a big deal. We'll accept it. That's unique to Mercury. Everything else obeys the one direction, but Mercury is unique. A guy comes along by the name of Galileo and he says, hey, what happens if we put the sun at the center? Let's put, you know, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, let's put the planets around that and let's see how well that model explains the movement of the stars. And lo and behold, you find out, hey, Mercury does do the same thing as all the other stars in the sky, and therefore the sun, being the center of the solar system, is a more accurate model. So nothing changed. Nothing changed in our world, nothing changed in our reality, nothing changed in our observations. The only thing that changed was our model. And we have a model that helps us better understand, it helps us get to the moon, it helps us get to Mars, it helps us do a lot of things because we have an accurate model of our reality. So with addiction, I've done a similar graphic because I thought it was fun and kind of cool. <laughs> um, but basically, you know, there seems to be a lot of different theories out there around addiction. Um, you know, what causes addiction, what helps addiction, and. So the one graphic there on the left, uh, basically I put substance use and substance dependency at the center and I put depression and anxiety as a symptom in the orbit, right? And it seems to be, when I read a lot of media stuff, that trauma seems to be a popular thing out there. Trauma causes addiction. If we didn't have such traumatic lives, we wouldn't have addiction. And so I put that trauma star in the middle. Um, the new model puts brain dysfunction at the center and it puts the symptoms, anxiety, depression, substance use, uh, it, problems with interpersonal relationships, behavioral control, emotional, dysfunctional emotional responses, as all the symptoms around the main disease, which is brain dysfunction. I've left trauma in there because it does have an impact. It does have a relationship with addiction. Trauma can trigger addiction. Trauma can make your experience with addiction worse. Um, one of the things we talk about, though, is if we're going to deal with trauma, we need to deal with addiction first, because then the trauma treatment becomes more effective. If we try to deal with trauma first, we can actually make the person's life worse. Oh, okay. So, so now let's get back to the reality of disease world and, and not my imaginary solar system. Um, so I didn't even know what the disease model meant. I had heard it, you know, I, I come into recovery and I think the disease model means that I get off easy, that I actually am a bad person, that I have moral weakness, and so some nice people came up with the term disease model to let me off the hook. Um, and then I think about disease as infectious diseases, so I need some sort of penicillin or bacteria to help me get well. Uh, it turns out that's not the way this is used either. So with the medical community, disease uh, relates to an organ, a defect in that organ, and some associated symptoms. So with diabetes as the disease, the organ is a pancreas, the defect is no insulin, and the symptoms are blindness, wounds, numbness, etc. With addiction, the organ is the brain, the defect is disruption or dysfunction of the pleasure circuitry, and the symptoms are what we all seem to think of as bad behaviors. So this just really simplified it for me to understand what disease means in terms of addiction. So a little bit about the brain reward circuitry. Its primary purpose is for survival. 
survival of the individual, and survival of the species, food, social living, and sex. Feel-good chemicals are released in the brain as motivation to pursue these activities and behaviors. And this is one of the things I learned from our conference last time, is there's about 300 million, or 30 million, sorry, compounds and chemicals known to man, and only about 200 have the same effect on the reward circuitry that food, social living, and sex have. I was kind of blown away by that. Uh, <clears throat> this is a simple schematic that uh, our medical advisor, Raju, has provided, <laughs> provided me to hopefully help us understand a little bit better about what we mean in terms of dysfunction. So we have these four parts of the brain. Control is the executive center, prefrontal cortex. The saliency is how important something is to us. The drive is the motivation and the memory. And in a healthy brain, the control and memory help regulate how important something is and our motivation to do something. In the addicted brain, the importance of something uh, gets magnified and exaggerated and our control and memory are diminished and we end up getting a signal to go and motivate us to do something pathologically. So we wanted to break that addiction down a little bit better to help us all understand the broader impl impl implications of, uh, of, of what the definition is. And so we've grouped it into three, moderate, mild, and severe. And severe addiction is what I think we all, of, we all think of, um, is people that have severe drug use or drug dependency. And if they don't do something different, their lives will end soon. Their lives will go bad. And that's that purple line on the chart. Um, through recovery, we get the dash purple line and we get back to you know, the green line that we call optimal living. With moderate addiction, uh, there's no real threat of eminent premature death, but there is a slow deterioration in the quality of your health. And the best example I have of this is smoking. Nobody has a risk of overdose from smoking cigarettes and having nicotine, but over a lifetime, chances are you will have some sort of lung disease or even lung cancer. So the quality of your life is diminished over time. With mild addiction, it's, again, the less severe, so the harmful effects are less obvious. Um, I read an article this week by the Harvard Business Review and it talked about how collaboration is not natural for people. And, and, and I kind of got a kick out of it because I think collaboration is. We see that that's the primary purpose of the reward circuitry is to be social creatures and work together. So I, I'm thinking, well, this article is basically saying that we live in a world, you know, polluted by addiction and that's what gets in our way of collaborating. Another article from the University of Southern California said, hey, when people work together, they're way more productive. And so the contrasting articles to me was just a fantastic way of demonstrating what mild addiction is. The harms aren't obvious to us because they're very subtle, but we're definitely hurting as a society and not progressing like we could if we didn't have some form of mild addiction. So this chart here is really focused on the moderate addiction uh, category. Um, and I just wanted to draw the links between uh, physical health conditions, chronic pain, neurological dis disorders, liver disease, lung disease, kidney disease, diabetes, cardiovascular, cancer, and a bunch of physical aspects. And they're likely addiction-related cause. And you'll notice that in that addiction-related cause, we do have substances. Um, but maybe the people aren't using those substances to the point of overdose or, you know, premature death. Um, and so this is our FAMH estimates right now. So if 50% of those physical health conditions are rooted in addiction, so when people have these physical health conditions, they usually see doctors or professionals that say, hey, here's some life changes you can make. And people go, okay, maybe I'll try to do it. And they seem to have a tough time making those changes. And so that's another indication of addiction. If you can't make the changes you need to make in your life that are associated with your physical health condition, it's your mental health that's getting in your way. It's moderate addiction that's getting in the way. And so when we add these numbers up, uh, about 30% or 1.2 million Albertans likely suffer from some sort of moderate addiction. I think that's a lot more costly to our society and to our, to our government than you know, the other ends of the spectrum. 
We think that about 20% of people probably have some sort of severe addiction and 20% some sort of mild addiction. Um, so prevention. I like to think this is one of our key messages because ideally, if we're in preventative mode, we don't have to worry about a healthcare system taking care of us or not taking care of us. Um, and so that starts with an annual checkup with a qualified mental health provider, sleep hygiene, meditation, nutrition, regular exercise, journaling, and spiritual practice. From the qualified mental health provider, um, you'll see the list is pretty short. <laughs> um, and we definitely want to get this list to be longer, and that's where I talked about building capacity early on as being one of our priorities. Um, but the key aspects of the mental health care provider is a multidisciplinary team. Nurse, psychologist, mental health care worker is that new definition of worker. Uh, mental health care specialist, you know, uh, at HUM, it is an addiction physician. And holistic approach to uh, treatment and prevention, biopsychosocial, spiritual. Embraces the ASAM de definition, primary chronic disease. Embraces a 12-step program, right? That's one of the aspects to treatment. So I gave you seven... Uh, items for prevention, there's another four or five that I do on a regular basis uh, because I do have a severe case of addiction. And medication as a last resort or is minimized. It's used strategically. It's not used as the crutch to, you know, carry you through to end of life. So this annual checkup is one of the key components to prevention. When I go to the dentist, I usually go, and I think most of you probably go on uh, annual basis, we go in, get our teeth clean, get it x-rayed, and if there's a problem, we, uh, the dentist fills the cavity, you know, we get ahead of this before the teeth rot and fall out. That's what we want to do with this. I would love it if the norm became an annual mental health checkup for all of us, especially our kids. For me, I know I had signs and symptoms of addiction from age six. If I could have gone to a qualified, educated, well-trained mental health care provider, I'm pretty sure my life would have gone a lot differently. Um, so sleep hygiene. It is the number one thing we do for our brain. Uh, the most important thing about it is regular wake and sleep patterns, seven days a week. Uh, it's associated with falling asleep quickly, easily, restful, continuous sleep, natural waking, and feeling refreshed. A typical person needs seven to nine hours. So a lot of people struggle with sleep. Well, it's interesting that the other six components or five components of our prevention program actually completely aid in sleep. So if we're doing meditation, regular exercise, nutrition, journaling, and a spiritual program, sleep hygiene just happens. Meditation. Uh, it's one of the few activities that we specifically do for the brain. So we'd get physical exercise because, you know, we want to be physically fit, but what do we do for the brain? Meditation is what we would like to see everybody doing. Um, and can actually help repair damage to the reward circuitry. Uh, we prefer the transcendental meditation technique. It helps somebody get deeper, faster. Um, and the rest of the stuff on the slide there reduces stress, anxiety, improves relationships. Like, I mean, these are all dealing with the symptoms of addiction. And TM has well documented their success in dealing with these symptoms. Nutrition. Very tricky one, because that is directly wired into our reward circuitry, our need for food, our need to feel good when we eat food. And so this, the circuitry was designed to tell us what's nutritious. And what happens nowadays is all food is designed to be delicious. And our brain has a tough time differentiating between nutrition and, and delicious nowadays. You know, in, in, in prehistoric times, I mean, bitter was bad. Stay away from it, it's poisonous. Sweet is good, I eat it. Um, generally, there's three basic tastes. Sweet is a safe source of energy. Fatty is a dense source of calories for long-term fat storage. And salty is a means of conserving fluid. The food we eat affects four primary hormones, insulin, leptin, glucagon, and cortisol. And these hormones fluctuate throughout the day depending on what food is in our body and how it is getting processed. Um, I, I, so we go to the Whole30. Um, to me, this is the best way to uh, reset your diet. It's no grains, no dairy, no preservatives, no added sugar. And it's something I did about two or three years ago. 
And um, the thing that happened was very interesting to me. So I, I, I've quit drugs and alcohol, I quit smoking, and so I, I go on this whole 30 program and they tell you what's gonna happen over 30 days. And so the first day, no big deal, but second day, they talk about how I have this free glucose running through my system. And so that's how my body has adapted to grab energy. And so instead of grabbing from fat stores, it's always looking for free glucose in the bloodstream. And so as that glucose is going down, because I'm no longer eating grains or added sugar, my cortisol level goes up because I'm getting stressed. My body starts to think that it's starving. And so Tuesday goes by, you know, I'm getting more and more stressed, anxious, like just, you know, vibrating. But, you know, I know eventually it'll pass. They've told me it would, and drugs and alcohol eventually passed as well. Wednesday night, I can't sleep. Like, I am just vibrating. So, yeah, I sit in front of the TV, you know, like a zombie, watch it all night. I know eventually I will sleep one day, right? Thursday comes around, I sleep fantastically. Um, but I have a using drink about cupcakes. <laughs> I, I am craving carbohydrates and sugar so bad, I'm walking through Kensington and crave cupcakes. I'm going in there and I'm just pounding them back like Homer Simpson. <laughs> you know, and I wake up all distressed, you know, a total using dream. But uh, yeah, it, it amazed me how much nutrition affects the quality of my health and my mental state on a regular basis. Exercise. So the key here is um, 150 minutes or more of moderate, vigorous aerobic activity per week in bouts of 10 minutes or more. Um, and, the, and the key is about getting increased blood flow and increased blood flow to the brain. So it spurs brain growth, boosts brain building hormones, fights depression, anxiety, reduces the effects of stress, improves your brain's executive function, increases sensitivity to insulin. So that's the important part is getting the blood flowing. Um, and, and I differentiate that because I, I know, as a lot of people in recovery, yoga becomes a big part of our recovery. I'm going to suggest that yoga sits more on the spiritual side of our recovery program, more so than the exercise, but it does depend how you do it. If you're doing it in these, you know, elevated heart rate states, we'll call it exercise. If you're doing it for personal uh, reflection, self-reflection and connection, then it's probably on the spiritual side. One thing that's popular nowadays um, is CrossFit. And CrossFit hits the important aspects of exercise for the brain. Journaling. Um, does anybody journal here? Okay. I love that, actually. <laughs> um, journal journaling was tough for me to, to, to get into doing, um, partly because I made it complicated. I didn't keep it simple. I was worried about, oh, what's, you know, keep it private. I was worried about if somebody reads it one day. You know, it has to be brilliant thoughts. The grammar has to be correct. It ha you know, like, gee. And so no, keep it simple. Keep it private, do it frequently, and do it in your own handwriting. There is some evidence to suggest that, you know, pen to paper um, has some sort of positive effect on the brain and, and connection with self. And I think the biggest benefits are, uh, of journaling are processing my feelings, uh, gaining some emotional intelligence, and self-awareness, building the relationship with myself, self-esteem, self-confidence, and self-discipline. It does reduce stress and anxiety and cultivates mindfulness. You guys probably know I like HBR, Harvard Business Review by now, and what was interesting, on July 7th, they wrote an article about how senior executives in the workplace would be better leaders if they journaled on a regular basis. So, spiritual program. Um, I find this one the trickiest point to talk about. Um, I do believe in the 12-step fellowships, and I do believe in a relationship with a higher power of your understanding. So I don't know how to talk about a spiritual program except to maybe throw some words out there and, and, and point you in, in a direction that you're going to figure out for yourself. Um, some things I think I do know is that it's a belief system that helps us be relatively happy, joyous, and free. So if you're believing in something that makes you want to, you know, hate people and go out and kill people, uh, maybe you want to change your belief system, right? It helps you accept life on life's terms. It's about knowing that you belong, that you're a part of, that you are good enough just the way you are. 
that all of life, everything, is connected. Um, it's a belief in a power greater than human power. And that's all I'm going to say about it. Early assessment. So this is similar. I've used different terms, uh, not to confuse people, but early assessment or comprehensive assessment I kind of use interchangeably. Uh, this basically does go hand in hand with the annual checkup. Uh, regular visits, so going annually, helps with early detection. Currently, through HUM, it is a three-part comprehensive ass assessment. It's basically a uh, broadly application of state-of-the-art clinical practices, which I, I think Raju is going to talk a bit about later. Um, but part one is a bio, biological assessment, so physical complaints related to addiction, mental health, and family history. Uh, part two is a psychological testing to measure mood, depression, anxiety, substance use, and social support. And part three is review the medications and taking all of the information into account for a holistic approach. Um, I know a lot of us will have benefit plans that give us uh, a certain amount of money for a psychologist or, or, or if some sort of social worker, some counseling support. And what I find interesting is how do we pick that person? It's usually a friend of a friend or somebody knows somebody, so we don't really, you know, get some good guidance. We show up, we tell them a little bit, and by the time they get to know us, our funding has run out. And do they even know what we need? Like, did they go through this three-part comprehensive assessment to really understand where I'm at as an individual and what my specific individual needs are? Not usually. Um, the bottom uh, image there is something uh, with the latest technology, it's called SPECT imaging. On the left-hand side is a healthy brain. On the right-hand side is, a, is an unhealthy brain. And it's a tool that I think would help complement the three-part assessment. Um, I think they would go hand in hand, and it would be nice if, uh, if we could get something like that in, in our city one day. Uh, okay. So this is our mental health care framework. This is our latest and greatest, I guess. <laughs> and... Uh, Basically, we have a patient, and we have doors number one, two, and three. Um, and door number one is maybe a mild addiction or the earliest form of prevention, where we're basically looking at just those seven things, and general, uh, an annual general checkup, and the other six activities to help us maintain our spiritual fitness. Um, in door number two, we might actually be noticing some signs and symptoms, some anxiety, depression, substance use, physical ailments, stuff like that. And this would be our mental health care worker. This is where things have not progressed to the point um, where we need a higher level of intervention. Like we need, I need some psychoanalysis. I mean, I don't know that I'm lying to myself. And, and usually somebody in front of me can believe me as well because I don't know that I'm lying to myself, so they don't think I'm lying. Like, it, it just gets trickier and trickier as we move through uh, the progression of the disease. It's a lot on that slide. I'm not going to go too much through it. So um, now our friend, Greg Truman here, has helped me understand that uh, there's more to primary care than family physicians. And especially at that, that door number one, we have chiropractors, we have nutritional specialists, we have a lot of other people out there that are in a preventative mindset already. And so these are people that we'd like to train and say, okay, here is a mental wellness program that they can add to their existing mental health care providing. Uh, the mental health care worker will be a one-year development plan. Um, Basically, there's some couple courses, these type of seminars, and about a thousand clinical hours to get them qualified to deal with people with moderate addiction. The mental health care specialist is a much more intensive program. Uh, it's about 3,000 uh, clinical hours and uh, much more seminars involved, much more training involved. So, public education. This is one of the things that we do for public education. I mean, we're glad to see a lot of professionals here today, but it's also part of our public education program. The other thing we do is uh, general sessions on the first Thursday of the month. The next series starts uh, October 5th. Uh, it'll be at uh, the HUM office. And then in the community by invitation. So we've had a great opportunity this month to go speak with the Alberta Foster Parent Association on uh, September 21st and also by corporate invitation as well. So 
Um, if we had a lot more money, we would uh, do some media campaigns. We'd like to help people, you know, re radio, press, maybe even TV. I mean, we've seen those participation type, uh, you know, promotions in the 80s. I, I grew up with them, John, or Joanne and John, or Don and Joanne. Doug and Joanne, yes, thank you. Yeah, something along those lines, you know, about what addiction is, help people have a better understanding. We want to change the way we think about it. You know, a mental wellness campaign, not just the physical aspect. And, you know, we've thrown in here a bit of the cage assessment, um, and, and that's to maybe help people diagnose. So if you're having a tough time cutting down, or you're annoyed by criticism, or you're feeling guilty, or if you have an eye opener, I think this is more related to drugs and alcohol, so you start the day, you know. Um, maybe it's time to go see your qualified professional. So hopefully we can, you know, help get the message out there broader. Our needs. We need volunteers. We need active operational board members. I think we have about six right now, five or six. And so we have room for nine. Um, we also need business administrators. So right now the active board does a lot of things. Um, and it would be nice just to have people help out with individual components. I mean, as a volunteer, you know, it's not a 40-hour week job, but it's probably a five, maybe 10 hour a month type role. Uh, we want volunteers to help do outreach and peer support. So a big part of our uh, mental health framework was cooperation with professionals and non-professionals. And so I showed you the professionals. But what we do is we'll align you with a non-professional with lived experience. The 12-step programs have done a great job of this over the last 100 years. Um, we want to introduce that professional element and the benefits of it. And, and I think a good example of when this would be helpful is when you go see your professional and they tell you something you don't like and you don't want to see them again. Um, this. <laughs> The, 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 this person can help you stay in process, right? And, and, and that's the important thing. I, I think some other psychologists, and, and I don't know, I don't, I won't even comment on that actually. Um, so we're hoping to have a volunteer info session uh, in October, next month. Uh, what else we need is money. Um, so I told you guys earlier that uh, the prevention treatment program subsidization, like we, basically only get 20% of the cost covered, if that, if we're lucky. Um, even from a professional development and training perspective, so I, I work in the oil patch, downtown Calgary, I get paid when I'm on a course, and they pay for my course, but professionals have to pay for their own course, and they don't get paid while they're on course. So we as a society aren't even helping the professionals do their jobs better. Uh, and then the public education media campaigns that I talked about. I want to highlight that FAMH has made a conscious decision not to go to Alberta Gaming and Liquor for the casinos and the bingos. I don't think it would be appropriate for our association to make money off people in those scenarios. Uh, <laughs> thank you. And so today, we have one of our partners from a donation side, Sponsor Energy over there. Dan, do you want to give a wave? And I, I don't know if you guys know about Sponsor Energy. I know uh, Fresh Start is part of the program as well. Um, but we can buy our electricity or natural gas through Sponsor Energy as a retailer, and they take 50% of their revenue and they donate it to the charity of your choice. So um, I think it's a fantastic opportunity uh, for sponsor and for FAMH and Fresh Start. I signed up, uh, I don't know, about a month ago when we finally had everything in order. And I, I, what, it takes like five minutes, if that? You know, yeah, yeah. So um, if you're so compelled today, um, you know, please visit Dan and, and you can sign up here today. Is that correct? Awesome. So yeah, right on. So that's us. Thank you.